Happy New Year, Heritage. I am so excited about what lies ahead as we celebrate out of this first weekend in the new year, what God's going to do in the rest of the year. I can't wait to see what he's going to do, and I can't think of a better way to start the new year than in the conversation we're beginning that we just are simply calling, Even If. Now, before we get to that, though, I think we would be remiss if we didn't take a few moments to celebrate and acknowledge all that God did in and through the Heritage Network in our approach to Christmas and through our Christmas celebration. I just want to highlight a few things about what happened across our network and how God worked in and through us. First of which, there were more than 500 volunteers out of our Go Be Love initiatives that were serving in spaces all across our cities, living sent, being the hands and feet of Jesus, great expressions of loving people. And then as a church, we packed more than 50,000 meals for Convoy of Hope. That's amazing and incredible. We have about 500 items given to the Lincoln Irving School store to serve those kids within, the, within that school. And then there were hundreds of families at Thurgood Marshall and Jefferson in our partnerships there that were, that were families and students were fed and served in those spaces. About $300 were given to the bus stop ministry that will provide 600 bus trips for students to or from school. And then there were more than a thousand gifts given to the men in Kiwani, which I just want to highlight something about that. I want to just, just describe what that is. The ability to give those men the opportunity to wrap a gift for their children was beautiful. Can't tell you how meaningful it was to stand and interact with some of those men as they shared how impactful it was, how, how it gave them dignity to be able to wrap that gift and provide it for their child at Christmas. It's a fantastic, wonderful expression of love, of being Jesus in that space. And I am super proud of my church family for the ways that they lead into that season. And we culminated. Yeah, you can celebrate all that. We culminated the celebration of all that with 15 different Christmas Eve services, including the services we held at the Rock Island County Jail, with more than 4,800 people and at least 76 people telling us that they chose to receive Jesus as the gift. This was, amen. It was a fabulous, fabulous celebration over the holidays. I'm excited for what the year holds ahead. I know there is, the best is still yet to come as God goes before us. But I, I do, I'm really excited about starting off the year with even if. Because I, I think this is a time of year where we, we begin to revisit or ask questions. Uh, what if questions. We all have some what if questions. It, it, the idea that, that we ask, what if it doesn't turn out? What, what, if, what if the worst happens? What if our plan doesn't land where we thought it would? We all have what if questions. And they're not inherently bad or wrong. We all have them. In fact, I want to invite you, on the way in, you would have received a, a note guide. Go ahead and grab that, pull it out. In the top left corner, you'll see the words, what if, with a column underneath. I want to encourage you, even now, to begin to reflect on what are the what if questions in your life? Whether you've been asking them, starting to ask them, what are some of the what if questions in your world? We all have them. Maybe as you're thinking through that, some of these will connect for you. What if things stay the way they are? What if things don't get better in, in my marriage, in my job? What if things don't get better in my body or relationships with my, my relationships with my kids or in my family dynamics? What if, what if I have cancer? What if God chooses not to heal? What if the business plan doesn't work out? What if we, what if we lose our spouse? What if, what if a parent dies? See, we all have what if questions. What, what are yours? They're not inherently bad or wrong, but it's what we do after we ask them that matters most. When I was a kid, I loved the Civil War. I just loved studying it. I read a lot about it. I even acted out a few battles a, a few times. And I, I, had a, I had a Union cap that I would wear, and I would carry a stick as my gun. Well, I got tired of carrying that stick. I, I really wanted a replica of a Civil War gun. And my grandpa Costin, my dad's dad, he had a hobby of working with wood and he had a shop and a shed in his backyard. And so I, I decided I would ask him if he'd make me a replica Civil War gun. He called me Little Ugly. I called him Big Ugly. And, and one day I went to him and I just asked if he would make me this gun. And he looked at me, he asked me a few questions, and then he said yes. And I was super excited, super excited. But then days went by, weeks went by, months went by, no gun. 
So in that space, though, I started asking some what-if questions. What if Grandpa forgot? What if Grandpa can't do it? What if Grandpa isn't going to do it? What if he never intended to do it? What if he can't deliver on the promise? What, what if he just said he would to be mean? I was, just be, I was just becoming consumed with what if questions to the point where one weekend I was at a local amusement park and I was in the gift shop and they had these frontier guns, which is just this little thin wood with a little pipe on the top and a little hammer, metal hammer. And, it, and I was looking at that and all the what if questions are running through my head. What if grandpa doesn't actually deliver on what he said he would? What if he doesn't fulfill his promise? What, what if I'm supposed to fulfill this? And so I ended up buying that cheap gun so that I would have a gun to do my reenactments of battles. And I loved it. It was great. I was excited about it until a few days later, my grandfather found out about it. And he never said a word. But I still remember the look of disappointment in his face. See, he knew that I had allowed the what if questions to create a space for me to doubt, to be impatient, to not wait, and to not trust in the promise that had been given. And I ended up settling for less, a cheap gun. I told him that I got it just to, as a placeholder until he got me the other one. <laughs> but he never made me the gun because I chose to settle for something less. You know, we've been having a conversation as we approach Christmas and into Christmas about navigating the space between what is and what isn't. I'm using a diagram like this to help us consider what, what that space is between now and next, the space between now and not yet. And we've been acknowledging that's a hard place to be. It's a, it's a space of waiting. But there is a space to wait well, and that's what we've been unpacking. Because when we choose a posture of faith, this becomes a space where we can embrace hope, we can have peace, we can have joy as we wait, placing our trust in the right place. This is a space where we have sought to know how to wait well. And we all end up in spaces like this, and we can wait well when we take a posture of faith in it. This diagram is still relevant as we begin our even-if conversation, because this is the space that we most often ask what if. This is the space we come up with the most what if questions. And we need to be able to understand how to move from what if to even if. See, that, that space between now and next is especially real to us even at this time of year, beginning of a new year. We can become consumed with revisiting, even obsessing over the what if questions and they can lead us to make poor decisions where we settle for less and we buy a cheap cap gun from an amusement park store. But God calls us to live a life and a faith that moves from what if to even if. A space where the unknown and the uncertain can be met with a certainty about who he is. Where the question what if is met with a declaration even if. Where the instability of our situation is countered by a steady faith. Uncertainty countered by certainty in who he is. Because even if life is hard, he is still working. Even if things don't turn out the way we hoped, he is still active. And our conversation over the next few weeks is going to position us to know how to live an even if faith amidst what if moments. But in order to do that, We've got to go back and make sure we have a clear understanding of the definition of faith. And there is a very clear description of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, and we've looked at this over the last few weeks. Here's what it says. Faith is being sure of what we hope for. It is being sure of what we do not see. That is what the people of long ago were praised for. Sure of what we hope for. Sure of what we do not see. This is the anchoring element for us for navigating the space between what is and isn't, between a now and next, being sure and certain, not of what, but of who. And that's a really important distinction, and it gets us to our first fill-in if you want to use your note guide today, that faith is rooted in our who, not our what. Faith is rooted in our who, not our what. This is actually something we walked through and looked at in our Christmas series called The Gift. 
The, the, the ability to wait between the now and the next, the, the now and the not yet. That space of faith is rooted in our who, not our what. Now, that space of faith doesn't mean we don't ask what if. We, we most certainly can ask what if. What if is not inherently bad or wrong. It's what we do after we ask what if that matters. And when we live in a posture of faith, we may end up asking what, we may have less what if questions, but what is most important is that it changes what we do after we ask what if, the response out of it. I want you to, I invite you to think about it this way with me, and I'm going to draw something that you don't have to draw. This is a bonus easel, therefore this is a bonus drawing. I just want you to be in my headspace for a moment. Whenever you and I ask a what if question, and again, it's not wrong or bad to do it. In fact, in some ways, it's good stewardship to ask what if. But the moment we ask what if, it puts us into a space of asking more what ifs of running the gambit of all kinds of questions and what if this happens and if that happens then what does this mean and we end up in a space where anxiety and fear and worry can all creep in because the moment we ask what if it just blows apart a a space in our world that chews up tons of headspace but we can actually instead when we choose a posture of faith land in a place not of question but of declaration instead of just sticking with what if we end up declaring, even if, even if. This is a space where we place our trust and our dependence on a who, on God. The difference between this space and this is that the focus is on who, and the focus over here is on what. And when we stand in a place of of a faith where it's rooted in our who and not our what, we can declare even if. And this is the space by which God can move. When we land in a space to say, even if, that's a space that God's willing and able to move. Whenever we focus on what more than who, then our circumstances define our life. But if we're willing to focus on who and declare even if, then God starts to define the circumstances of our life. He starts to identify what's a problem and what's an opportunity. Everything begins to change. And the what's of our journey become less important, less significant in the influencing our lives. We can make better decisions in this space and we can wait well when our focus is more on who than what. Faith is rooted in our who, not our what. We're going to explore this a bit more as we walk in this series, even if. And we're going to do it with the help of one particular family, a family of a man by the name of Abraham. And and we're going to look at Abraham's life, his life, his experiences, and his family's experience are going to help us understand in our own lives how to move from what if to even if. Now, the story of Abraham is actually recorded in the book of Genesis in the Bible. The story of Abraham and all of his, his descendants are captured in that book of Genesis. And we actually come across Abraham when his name is actually Abram. God is going to give him a new name, Abraham, later after he invites him into an even if faith. But we start out knowing him simply as Abram. And we find him and encounter him in in Genesis chapter 11. And we don't know a whole lot about him at this point. We know he's from a place called Ur. You are in Mesopotamia. It's modern day Iraq. And we know that his vocation was shepherd. That's about the extent of the background information we have on Abram. We, we know that he moves to a place called Haran with his father, Terah, and that's our, stor- our starting point with him. Now, we know from history that at this time period, many people believed in and worshipped many gods. But Abram was different. He was different because he heard the call of one God, and he embraced the reality of one true God. And in Genesis 12, which is where we're going to start, if you've got a Bible, you can turn there and follow along from there. But in Genesis chapter 12, that God invites Abram into an even if faith. He invites him to move to a new place. And in the context of the journey, he makes a promise of three things to Abram. The promise of relationship with him, the promise of many descendants, and the promise of land. So let's take a look at this. This is Genesis chapter 12. We're starting with verse 1, and we're going to continue on from there. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. 
I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on the earth will be blessed through you. Now that, this, this is all good, good stuff, super stuff. The problem is that Abram and his wife Sarai, who will later be called Sarah, are old. And they don't have any kids. And now they're being asked to leave their home, go to somewhere. This, this scenario and these promises seem like they're almost imposs- an impossible scenario. But the amazing thing about Abram is that he doesn't get lost in the what ifs. He just does what God says. So go back to the text with me, verse 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. This, my friends, is impressive. God doesn't give any signs or wonders. Abram doesn't have any text to go back to or, or traditions to go back to. And even the instructions that God gave are vague. Leave and go to the land that I will show you. Aside from God speaking, which counts for something, Abram doesn't have a whole lot to enter into a now and not yet space. The the now and next, the is and isn't space. But Abram chooses to believe. And faith is born as he trusts in this God who to him is not yet named. But it's the beginning of what if transitioning to even if. And as a result of this moment and many others, Abram will go down in history as a man of great faith. In Genesis 15, we read this about him. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Because of Abram's obedience, because of his willingness to step out in faith, God gives Abram a new name, and it is Abraham, which means father of many. Because Abraham stepped into the is and isn't space with faith, because he navigated the now and not yet, trusting and depending, declaring even if, God gave him a new name and his faith grew. But it's a really important dynamic that we're going to get into today to understand how we move from what if to even if. And it has to do with the reality about faith. Because faith is demonstrated in moments. Faith is demonstrated in moments. It's day-to-day, case-by-case, demonstrated in moments. We show it in day-to-day realities, but it is defined over time. Faith is, is demonstrated and shown in moments, but it is defined over time. Now, we're going to get more into that in a moment. I want to unpack that a bit further. But what I want to do for the rest of our time today is actually lay a foundation, kind of the groundwork of understanding the life of Abraham and his descendants that will guide us through the rest of our series, the Even If Journey, as we come in and out of his life. And on page three of your note guide, you're actually going to see a a family tree that looks kind of like this. It's kind of, it's convoluted. It's not perfect. And Abraham's family wasn't perfect. No family is. And I realize you can't see this picture up here from many of you across the network. That's okay. It's in your note guide. I just want to show you and give you an opportunity to begin to reflect on looking at the big picture of his family because there are some unique dynamics. And we'll unpack some of this along the way. But his family wasn't perfect. We're going to lean into understanding that, not to disparage them, but so that we can learn from them. So we can learn how to move from what if to even if. Because they they had what if moments and they had even if moments. And for today, what I want to focus in on is four generations. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. A father, a son, a grandson, and a great-grandson. And I want to spend a few moments kind of laying out how what if and even if played out in their journeys. We're going to cover basically from Genesis 11 to, to Genesis 37. And I do want to invite you to go ahead and draw this with me. And you can do that in the big open square in the second page of your note guide. We're looking at four generations. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Father, son, grandson, great-grandson. Now, I already said that we meet Abraham in, in chapter 11 of Genesis. We don't know a whole lot. We know he is a descendant of Shem, who is a son of Noah. And we know that God has called him out to go to a place that God would show him. 
Now, he starts that travel. We already said he obeys God. And when we get into Genesis 12, as he's traveling, Abraham begins to ask some what-if questions. You see, his wife Sarah is beautiful. And he begins to think in his head and run through the what-if questions of what if someone recognizes her beauty and wants her so badly they're going to kill me as her husband so they can have her. He starts churning in the what-ifs, and he comes up with a plan that he will say that his wife is his sister so that nobody will kill him to take her. Crazy. But when, when what-if starts to consume him, he loses sight of who, and he focuses on what? He loses sight of God, he loses sight of Sarah, and he focuses on the problem, the risk, or the danger. It consumed him. So he actually says, this is my sister. And in the journey into Egypt, Pharaoh recognizes the beauty of Sarah, this sister of Abraham, this traveler, and he takes her as his bride. It is nuts. But whenever what if consumes us, we lose sight of who, and we don't live into even if. Now, fortunately, God intervenes in this dynamic, and out of that space, Abraham begins to learn at a new level what it means to live by faith, and even if faith. In fact, in Genesis 15, he says to Abraham, look, I'm going to make you the father of nations. I'm going to make you the father of my people. Look up at the stars. That's, see the numerous stars? As countless as they are, that's, the, that's how numerous your descendants will be. It's a beautiful promise. But as we get into Genesis 16, Abraham and Sarah begin to ask a new set of what-if questions. They say, what if we're too old to have kids? What, what, what if we can't have any kids? What, what if God won't fulfill his promise? What if we're supposed to be doing something different to make that promise happen? And as a result, Sarah says to Abraham, Hey, Abraham, why don't you sleep with my servant, Hagar, and we'll get this baby-making thing going? And they do. Because when what if consumes us, we lose sight of who and we focus on what? Now, Abraham does have a child by Hagar. That child is called Ishmael. And that is the split. That is the split from Judaism that ultimately leads to Islam. Ishmael. Because it wasn't God's chosen child. Now, again, God is faithful. He has grace. He, he works and moves in the space. He, he works with Abraham. He calls him back into obedience. And, and, and he continues to learn an even if posture. But by the time he gets to Genesis chapter 20, Abraham Backfalls. He, he backslides. He steps back and he regresses. And out of a fear for his own safety, he once again lies and says his wife is his sister and not his wife. But this time he does it to a man by the name of King Abimelech. We'll just call him King A.B. And that king takes Sarah as his wife. When what if consumes us, we lose sight of who? And we make bad choices. And we buy the cheap cap gun rather than waiting for the promise. Now, God once again intervenes in this space. He's gracious. And as a result, Abraham finally starts to live into an even if faith. In Genesis 21, they have Isaac, the intended child from the beginning, the promised child. But in Genesis 22, Abraham is, is positioned with the greatest test that he would ever face. God calls him to sacrifice his son Isaac. But by this point, Abraham has moved from what if to an even if faith. And he follows through in obedience, even if. And God intervenes once again, but this time not to correct, this time to provide. It's beautiful. Whenever what if consumes us, we make bad choices. Faith is rooted in our who, not our what. But if we take that what if posture, it, it impacts those around us. And so what ends up happening is in Genesis 26, Isaac, who is now married to a woman named Rebecca, follows his father's example and does the very same thing his father did. He lies and says his wife, Rebecca, is his sister and not his wife to protect, his own, his, protect himself. And he does it to a man by the name of King Abimelech. Now, some say that's not the same king, that it was just a title for two different people. Some say it was the same king. I don't know, it doesn't matter to me. If you're King Abimelech, you stay away from this family and their sisters. When we choose a what-if posture that ripples in ways that we can't even begin to understand. And it, it continues because by the time we get to Genesis 27, Isaac has a son named Jacob. And Jacob ends up lying to his dad with his mom to steal the birthright of his brother Esau. Now it's with his mom, the, the mom who was lied about by her husband, who probably heard the stories of her father-in-law lying about her mother-in-law. A what-if pattern 
can ripple into generations of behavior in a family. So much so that when Jacob actually finds a woman to marry in Genesis 29, her name is Rachel, in the family of his uncle Laban, he works seven years to marry Rachel, but Laban tricks him into marrying Leah, the older sister, first. So he has to work another seven years for Rachel. A pattern of selfish deception because of what if questions rippling through this family. So much so that actually the sons of Leah, Leah's sons in Genesis 37, lie to their dad about Joseph, their brother. Joseph had said, he had declared dreams of being in charge, that they would bow down, and he was favored, and they didn't like that. They, they kind of hated him. They mocked him. And so they end up selling him into slavery, and then they lie to their dad, Jacob, and say he was killed. When what if consumes us, and we don't move to even if, we make bad choices, and we end up focusing on the what's and lose sight of the who. This pattern continues until we get to Joseph. When Joseph is someone who decides to live an even if faith. He was mocked, he was hated, he was lied about, he was lied to, he was falsely accused, sold into slavery, forgotten. Yet he committed himself to be a person who lived an even if faith. It would cost him. It would cost him years of his life. It would cost him relationships. It would cost him in, in lots of ways he couldn't even begin to, to even measure. But he was willing to be humble. He was willing to forgive. He was willing to hold steady and fast to an even if faith. And because of that, a ripple of behavior throughout a generation and generations of family was changed. I said a, a few moments ago that, that faith is demonstrated in moments, but it's defined over time. It's a little bit like loyalty. Many people think that loyalty has to do with some kind of tenure. Most people think that it's how long you have been loyal and how many times you have been loyal that actually defines your loyalty. But that's actually not the case. Loyalty is based and defined in a moment. Either we are or we are not in that moment. And the same is true when it comes to faith. We either have it or not. We either choose it or not in the moments, in any what if moment. It's demonstrated in moments. It's defined over time. And we see this in Abraham's life. He, he had moments where he stumbled, but he also had moments where he stepped up. He had moments where he slipped backwards, but moments where he strided forward in faith. He had moments of great faith, but then moments of little faith. He had moments where he chose the who over the what, and then moments where he chose what over who. And every time he did that, it created problems that rippled into his family and it positioned them to have their own struggle around the what and the who in the what-if dynamics of life. Our faith is demonstrated in moments, but it's defined over time. And, and Abraham would ultimately be a man who demonstrated great faith. And, and I got to tell you, without faith, it's actually impossible to please God. We can't please him without faith. Hebrews 11 in verse 6 tells us that, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Those who come to God must believe that he exists and they must believe that he rewards those who look to him. Choosing even if over what if, focusing on the who of God rather than the what of what we're facing is demonstrating faith. And God is pleased with it, and he rewards it. We all make mistakes. I know that. We, we all have moments where we waver. And, and any time we choose the what over the who makes us more vulnerable to choose poorly and to settle for something less. But when we focus on him first, we put our faith in him, well, now we actually step into a place where he can work and move in any complexity. Our daily choices matter. Our daily choices of faith matter, and they're measured over a lifetime. So listen to me. Whatever you're facing today, if you're facing a king, you're facing setbacks, you're facing failures, your own or somebody else's, you're facing betrayals, whatever you are facing, know and understand that where God is involved, he will make a way. 
Wherever God has authority in your life, wherever he has priority in your life, wherever he is involved, he will make a way. The space between what is and isn't, the uncertainty of that, the difficulty of that, the untimely nature of it, the uncomfortability of it, all of that can be hard. The space of what if creates a a headspace churning this mess for us where we worry and we fear and we have anxiety and we stress over the things that we don't even know and All of that stuff can mess with us until it meets an even if faith. And the moment it meets an even if faith, everything changes. It is the space by which God can move and make a way. When we focus on who more than what. Because my friends, no matter what you're facing right now and all the unknowns that we each have, if God has orchestrated the circumstances or allowed you to be there, he's more than able to work in it if you will let him with an even if faith. In fact, it was Oswald Chambers who says it really, really clearly in a simple statement. He says, if God put you there, he is amply sufficient. If God put you in the space that you're in, if he's allowed it or orchestrated it, he is more than able, he is amply sufficient to work you through that dynamic. But you gotta choose to embrace him. You gotta choose to focus on the who more than the what. And I gotta tell you, at the start of a new year, is one of the prime opportunities where we we can look at the year ahead and look at the days ahead and we can have some things we're expecting about and some things we're kind of worried about. We have some things that we're excited and some things that we're burdened by. And whether you're weary or whether you're ready, all of that is an opportunity to choose an even if faith. Not sit in the questions of what if, but move to a declaration of even if. It's this, that in between is a space of faith. All of the uncertainty, whether you're struggling in some kind of doubt or fear or the circumstances you face are so overwhelming and looming, they're just crushing in on you. The timing of something isn't working out. All of that is a place to live by faith, by declaring even if. But you got to choose it. You have to choose to say even if. So What? What do we do now as we get ready to look at the rest of our series together? How do, we, how do we step out of this moment for the coming week? Well, I want you to understand that our circumstances, whatever they are, mine or yours, whatever our circumstances are, they are the perfect place to demonstrate the power and purity of Jesus. Whatever you're facing, the perfect place to demonstrate his power and his purity. That's what that space can be. Abraham's legacy uh, involved a pattern of choosing what if over even if. And that led to self-serving deception that rippled in his life and into his family's life for generations. They were lying to get what they wanted, lying to get what they felt they needed. It was not healthy. And again, not highlighting this to disparage them, highlighting this so we can learn because we have our own what-if stuff and our own even-if opportunities if we'll choose them. But we need to know how to navigate them. And that's why we're looking to learn, to understand and navigate how to walk with God because that's exactly what Abraham did. He was a great man of faith. So listen to me. Even if we can't, he can. Whatever you're facing, that thing that seems impossible, even if you can't, he can. Even if we don't, he does. He is faithful, he is good, he is true. Even if we lean on our heels rather than our toes, even if we don't, he does. And even if we won't, he will. He will. He is good. He is gracious. But it requires us to step into a posture of even if. A a declaration space of like, I don't know, I don't see it all, but even if, even if, I choose to trust, I choose to believe, I choose to obey. Our current circumstances, our current challenges, our current questions are the perfect place to demonstrate the power and purity of Jesus. Let him do that by choosing an even if posture. The space between is and isn't is a space of faith. It's a space where we can choose to trust. No matter what you're facing, he will make a way when you give him authority, when you allow him to be involved. He will make a way. It's not always the way we want and not always in the timing that we want. Hear me. But he will make a way for his good and for his glory through our faithfulness, through our obedience through our faith, and if we're not willing to demonstrate those things and do those, he will find someone else. He will find a Joseph. But he actually wants us to be Joseph, 
He wants us to step into those spaces and he wants to demonstrate that he is more than able. More than able. Here's what he says about himself in Jeremiah 32. He says, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? The simple answer is no. Nothing is too hard for him. Nothing you're facing is too hard for him. It's not beyond him. He is more than able. Nothing is too hard for him. So let your what if questions become even if moments. Let that transition into a space where you can experience all that he is. Let them become even if moments. Faith doesn't always know where it's being led. Abraham didn't know where God was going to lead him. When he told him to go somewhere, he would show him. We don't always know where we're being led, but when we know and love the one who's leading, we can go. And we can step saying even if with a faith that is sure and certain, not in our what, but in our who. And that's possible. You can have that kind of faith. God calls us to it. He doesn't call us to a faith that we can't get to or he's not willing to help us get to. That would be cruel. He actually calls us to a faith he's willing to help us get into. And, and the reality is Abraham struggled in that faith just like we can. Yet, yet in the end, Abraham trusted God. He experienced the fulfillment of every promise and he saw the redemption of his mistakes. This, this family journey from, from Genesis 11 all the way to Genesis 37 is marked by moments where the family got consumed with what if. There are even if moments also in here. But a sequence of what if consuming and losing sight of the who and just focusing on what. Until one person, Joseph, said is enough is enough. No more. No matter what happens, even if. I choose to trust I choose to believe. And I'm convinced that some of you are positioned in your families to be Joseph today. You have seen the dysfunction in your family. You have seen the bad behavior. You struggled with it. Some of you have even dabbled in it, maybe even involved from the start. But you are positioned to be Joseph today, to say even if and not get consumed in the what ifs. So my challenge for you is to do the right thing at the earliest possible time. Do the next right thing at the earliest possible time. If, if you're not in relationship with God, I'm going to tell you what your next right thing is. It's to get in relationship with God through Jesus. Without that, living in even if faith is way too hard. We're, we're missing some components and pieces to live into the fullness of that. We don't even have the who if we don't have relationship with God through Jesus. And if you need to step into that, there's some instructions in, your, in the note guide that can help you get there. And if you need to make that decision, even make that decision today, or if you're someone who's made the decision before, but you realize you need to step further into an even if faith, I actually want to encourage all of us to get back to that first part of the, of the note guide. Go ahead and turn to the first page. Up there we had that column. I said there's what if and invited you to consider the what if questions you've been dealing with. Maybe you've considered those. Maybe you wrote a few down. What I want to encourage you to do right now is to begin to identify in, in the column right next to it, right even if in the blank spot at the top, and identify the even if response to every what if question you have. Don't just think about it, write it down. If you need to take time now, take time today, through the rest of the week, take the time you need, but identify the even if response to the what if question. What is God asking you to do? If you don't know, ask him, talk to him. He wants to help you in the process of walking in even if faith. He is more than able, he is more than willing to help. In fact, one chapter after he said, is anything too dif too difficult for me? Here's what he said. He said, call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. Talk to him. He will speak to you. He will lead you. He wants to come alongside you in a space where you can navigate the complexity and it be well with your soul. See, here's a, here's a fundamental reality about the what if space. This, this churn, this complexity chews up so much headspace and it tears at our soul. It really does. It rips and tears at our soul. But there is a space to get to, and even if space, where we can say it is well with our soul. Because our hope and our trust and our dependence is in a God who is more than able. It is not in the what. And you can get there. And I don't want you to miss the opportunity today to do that. So I want to encourage you to just continue to reflect on what your even-if responses should be to your what-if questions today. 
worship teams are going to come in a few moments across our network. They're going to lead us in a song of reflection that takes us a bit further in the things we've been talking about. But I encourage each of you to remain seated in a posture of reflection and prayer, asking God where it is that you need to choose even if. And ask him for the strength and the understanding to do it so you can get to the point where you can say it is well with my soul. Not ever settling for less. Don't settle for the cheap cap gun. Wait for the promise. Wait for him to move, but do it with an expectant posture of even if. He will show up. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I am so grateful that you are a God who loves without ending, that you have made repeated moves for us to know you. We can know you from scripture. We can know you from creation. We know you by Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that we would each, all of us, know you more. And as we know who you are, we would focus on who you are in the midst of the what's that we face. We wouldn't allow the what if questions to churn and tear at our soul, but that we would allow you in your character, in your strength, in your power, where nothing's too difficult for you to work and move in our lives in ways that only you can. So over the next few moments as we sing and as my brothers and sisters reflect on the even if responses you're calling them to out of the what if questions they have in their lives. I pray that you would speak, Lord. You would speak and that we, none of us would ever settle for less than your purpose and your plan. I love you. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen.